Welcome back, everybody, to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have uh, James Bullard with us, the president and CEO of the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. Hi, Jim. Nice to have you. Uh, James Bullard will talk about is the Fed behind the curve? Question mark. And he will give two different interpretations. And we'll learn a lot about how one thinks how to catch up essentially if one is behind the curve or how one does it. So inflation was on this webinar series, we have covered inflation extensively. And I just want to do a little bit of advertising about the previous webinars we had on the inflation topic since 2020, January 2020. It started with Charles Goodhart, who really early identified all the inflation threats based on his book he recently wrote. And we had the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jay Powell, uh, in January 2020. We had a big debate between Krugman and Summers in February 2020, and another debate one year later. Imi Nakamura was talking about the flatness of the Phillips, Phillips curve. Then we had Alberto Cavallo from HBS, who analyzes online prices to get a prediction of inflation coming forward. And Mervyn King was talking about central banking. Alan Blinder was talking about soft versus hard landing. We will come back to that today as well, I guess. Yuri Korontejenko was talking about inflation expectations. Ricardo Reis was talking about inflation expectations derived from option prices, where you get the whole distribution of inflation expectations. And then uh, Itamar Drexler and Alexis Savos were talking about investing. If you have high inflation, what you should do. So if you look at inflations and inflation forecasts, just this week, the IMF came out with its most recent inflation forecasts. And what you can see for the United States, the inflation is going up and they predict it will peak uh, at a high rate and then come back very quickly after one in one, one year, a little bit more than one year, we are close to the target again. The January 2020 prediction was also coming back very quickly and earlier they didn't predict such a subsequent increase. So this is now the current prediction after the invasion of, of Russia into Ukraine. This in January 2020 was before the invasion uh, of Russia and Ukraine. In Europe, the situation is not much better I and mean, it's a little bit lower, but it takes a little bit longer to come back to close to the inflation target. But it's also much worse than it is anticipated before and all anticipation uh, is a uh, much worse situation. But again, the assumption here from the IMF is that you come back to the target fairly quickly in, in, in the US and as well as in the euro area. For the emerging economies, situation is, is also very dire. So we have high inflation rates all over the world. The exception is to some extent uh, Asia, where the, the increase in inflation uh, in Japan and other Asian countries is less pronounced. Now, the question is, what is the monetary policy's reaction time? In a sense, there's a tension there. If you do monetary policy today, how long does it take until it really affects the real economy? And there are two aspects I would like to contrast. One is, it's well known that there's the delayed impact of monetary policy on the real economy because it takes time until you know the low interest rate or high interest rate feeds into real decision making. So monetary policy has to be forward looking. And but if you look at the new 2020 Fed framework, it was actually underemphasizing the forward looking element of, um, of monetary policy. On the other hand, so that's essentially arguing you should actually act very early. On the other hand, future rate hikes are also already priced in. If you look at the long-term bond prices and other brand prices, they are, so they are all, so when people anticipate there will be future rate hikes, they will already slowing down the economy today. So that works in the opposite direction. And this works when the communication is working well of the central bank. And it depends on the credibility of the reaction function of the central bank. So this forward guidance or communication uh, is a key element which plays more and more important role in more recent uh, events. And there's also some critique with how powerful is forward guidance, how, or is it less powerful than people think. And there are different types of forward guidance. One is the Delphian forward guidance, where you just communicate well what you think in the future the interest rate will be, but you don't commit to that. And then there's your this year forward guidance where you really commit to certain interest rates down the road and you might want to change your mind later on, but because you committed, you cannot then optimally respond what you find subsequently optimal, not what you find today optimally. And perhaps you can go into these uh, aspects as well. Now, in a sense, the question, the big drawback, and the big question we are facing at the moment is 
Do you want to have a swift uh, reaction, but ultimately you probably need less of a hike, or do you want to do it more slowly, but ultimately you might need a larger hike? So I'll put it differently, one strategy is putting uh, one stitch in time saves nine, essentially you react quickly, and this means you don't have to make so many tightening uh, elements later on, or you go for the alternative is to act very slowly, but ultimately you might, because you might be behind the curve, you might have to act more drastically. And that's a timing question, how you want to act to that. And my question is then, you know, how does it interact with fiscal and financial dominance? If you act more slowly, it might be less of an issue for the sovereign debt market or the financial markets more generally. If you act very sharply, that might actually lead to some dislocation on the financial market side. And is this important or not? Should the Fed care about that? In particular, if it doesn't translate into some real dislocations. And that leads me already to the soft versus hard landing. And we had Alan Blinder on a webinar earlier who was arguing uh, a soft landing. And typically, when you, you went through all the uh, tightening cycles, and it's typically at about 300 basis points, this tightening cycles, even earlier when inflation was uh, not so high. And one prominent example was in the early 1990s, where you know there was a soft landing in the real economy, but there was a hard landing on the bond market. And the question is, should the Fed care about the hard landing in the bond market as long as the GDP is as a soft landing? And to what extent we can generate a soft landing from that? And in contrast, uh, Larry Summers and Korda just brought out an NBR paper where he argues in a world where the labor market is so super tight as it is right now, there will be wage inflation, wage inflation will drag on, and there's no way to get rid of this higher inflation, in particular wage inflation, without a tightening uh, a hard landing. And so he argues it would be very difficult, almost impossible to get the hard landing. So these are two perspectives, but the question is always lending in what? Lending in the real economy, lending in the financial economy. And that one has to take into account as well. Now, what's about the inflation anchor and the monetary policy framework? So that we know that, you know, whether you can really uh, do this smoothly depends very much as whether the inflation anchor holds or not. And what I find interesting is that if you, the inflation expectations of households in particular is driven by some salient prices, in particular the gas prices. And so one should watch out how the gas prices develop because this might actually destabilize the inflation anchor. And on the other hand, the gas price, because it's so flexible, is not part of the core inflation index. So there's a tension there. On the one hand, we should look at the gas prices a lot because it might destroy the inflation anchor. On the other hand, it's not part of the core, so we don't focus so much on it. So that's an interesting tension to discuss uh, as well. And of course, the credibility of the central bank's reaction function is key in all of these things. And it would be nice to understand better to what extent the flag flexible average inflation targeting framework, which was established in August 2020, is still alive or not. Are we still trying to take some average over inflations or not? Or are we going back to the previous uh, monetary policy framework? And is it still the case, given that inflation is now so high, that actually we will actually undershoot the target of 2% down the road? And the second element of this new uh, inflation targeting regime that we look more how the labor market, put more emphasis on the labor market, less on inflation, and we don't do this forward-looking element, are these elements still to be staying? And I think it would be nice to get some more insights uh, on this as well, what the thinking is uh, at, uh, at the St. Louis Fed and more generally at the whole. Uh, Fed board. Now we had a few poll questions uh, to be answered, and here are uh, some questions which I put forward. Is the Fed behind the curve? Yes or no? And actually, 80% think yes, 20% say no. The other question is the ECB behind the curve? 75% say yes, and 25% say no. So it's a little bit, seems like the ECB is a little bit less behind the curve, but uh, I also feel like the, the, the Fed has decided now to move aggressively while the ECB is not, is still waiting. And what interest rate impacts the economy? So which interest rate is really impacting the real economy the most or the behavior of people the most? Is it the short rate? Is it the mortgage rate? Or is it the corporate loan rate? 
And the answers here were 33% think the short trade is very important. The majority think the mortgage rates are very important. So these are longer duration maturity interest rates, 48% think this way. And 20% thought the corporate loan rate uh, is very important. So it's a short trade and corporate loan rate, but primarily the mortgage rates through the housing market has probably the biggest impact. And do we think that, that the lending will be soft? Here we we'll focus on real GDP growth rather than you know, financial aspects. Uh, hard lending thought 75% and soft lending 25%. So many people actually expect a hard lending also for the real economy. So with this brief opening remarks, I will pass on the floor to uh, Jim, who will tell us the two different angles whether one can see whether the Fed is behind the curve or not and answer perhaps go beyond the questions and answer the question as well and gives this perspective uh, how do we best think about this um, US monetary policy and, and at, at this stage. Thanks again for doing it and being with us uh, today. Great, thanks uh, Marcus and thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to trying out this material with the uh, group here and I'm looking forward to the question and answer period and see what you guys think. Um, my answers on the poll would be uh, from this talk are gonna be yes, the Fed's behind the curve, although you have to reinterpret it a little bit, uh, but no, we're not gonna have a hard landing. So uh, the audience is wrong on, on that. So um, <clears throat> this is called, is the Fed behind the curve? Two interpretations. And it's uh, very much uh, trying to get a handle on uh, where policy is right now, given the burst of inflation that we've had in the last year. Uh, the subtext here, which was uh, alluded to in uh, the opening comments by Marcus, is that uh, is a quote from Ben Bernanke, which I believe is correct, that he said uh, monetary policy is 90% communication and 10% action. Uh, so we're very much going to explore that angle uh, today in these slides. Um, I've taken uh, uh, the real economy part of this talk out. So um, I thought I might just mention at the beginning that, you know, real growth in the U.S. for 2022 is still projected to be around 3%, depending on uh, who you talk to. Labor markets are at a generational high. If you look at the labor market conditions index uh, from the Kansas City Fed, it's at the highest level that it's been in, uh, in 25 years. Uh, so very hot, very tight uh, labor market. And on recessions, I would just say that uh, in the inflation targeting era, which I would date from 1995, uh, the, the recessions that have occurred have occurred because of shocks or because of bursting of asset price bubbles and not, uh, not because of monetary policy. That came from, those recessions came from an earlier era where monetary policymakers didn't have as much credibility as they have today. So that'll be a theme of, uh, of these slides here. So let's uh, get into it and, uh, and is the Fed behind the curve? Two interpretations. Let's go to the next slide. So the, um, the themes here are that uh, U.S. inflation is not just above target, it's exceptionally high, and it's comparable to the 1970s period, and I'll have a chart and I'll talk about this way, uh, and, and uh, so that's the first point. Um, if you take this is all going to be a Taylor rule type uh, calculation here in this talk. If you take a standard Taylor type monetary policy rule and you make some generous assumptions, I'll talk extensively about the generous assumptions, it's still going to recommend substantial increases in the policy rate. So that provides one baseline definition of the idea that the Fed is uh, behind the curve. And indeed, by that definition, uh, we're way behind. But uh, I'm also going to argue that all is not lost here uh, because uh, modern central banks are a lot more credible than their 1970s counterparts, and in particular, we make extensive use of forward guidance and transparency in monetary policy making. Because of that, market-based pricing has changed dramatically since last November. Um, 
And so the because the market interest rates have increased substantially in advance of tangible uh, Fed action, uh, we can get a different definition of whether we're behind the curve or not compared to the Taylor Rule calculation. And based on that, we're not as far behind the curve uh, based on that definition. And uh, one of the slides might even suggest that um, we're in a pretty good place with respect to policy. So I'll point that out uh, when we get to that point. So this is basically the, uh, the gist of the slide deck here. Let's go to the next slide. And the next slide. Uh, so uh, when I say inflation is high, um, you know, I'm willing to throw out the food and energy components, at least for now, and just talk about core inflation. And uh, the one, the measure that the committee uh, likes is core personal consumption expenditure inflation measured from one year earlier. That number is 5.4% uh, as of February. Um, there have been only the sense in which this is extremely high is that there have been only two other times since 1960 when the committee sat down and was looking at a 5.4% core personal consumption expenditures inflation rate. One time was in 1974 and the other time was in 1983. Let's go to the next slide. So Jim, can you explain why the committee like the PCE inflation index the best among all indices? Yeah, there was a there was a, a, in the 90s, there was an assessment of inflation measurement. I think we're overdue for a reassessment of inflation measurement. But in the 90s, there was, um, uh, led by Greenspan, uh, there was a look at whether we should use consumer price index inflation or core PCE inflation. And the, uh, the answer was PCE inflation because it was uh, thought to be a broader measure of price uh, prices in the economy and give you a better sense of, uh, of uh, uh, the overall inflation picture. And uh, then you can throw out the food and energy components if you want, and then you get core PC inflation. So really, strictly speaking, this should be the, the measure we all look at because the committee has enshrined this by putting in, in its summary of economic projections uh, as, as one of the things that gets mentioned there. And so this is the um, most logical measure to talk about. Now, there are many other measures and I'm gonna talk about some other ones here, but, uh, but this is the one that the committee prefers. Um, this is the picture since 1960, the blue line is core PCE inflation. Uh, and so many will be very familiar with this picture. Uh, we're at 5.4% on the right-hand part of this chart. So if you draw the dotted red line back uh, across history, you see that you only get these two crossings once in 1974 and once in 1983. Um, so I'm gonna talk about mon what monetary policy did in these two periods. Let's go to the next slide. So the 1974 FOMC, which was looking at uh, the same kind of core PC inflation that we're looking at today, they talked a lot about non-monetary factors uh, affecting inflation, uh, not unlike today. Uh, they like to keep the policy rate uh, relatively low, uh, even though inflation was rising. Um, the associated ex post real interest rate was relatively low, much as it is uh, today. In fact, our ex post real interest rate might be even lower than it was in 1974. And what did they get out of that kind of policy uh, view? Uh, the subsequent experience was a core PC inflation was above 5.4% for nearly a decade after they met on that day in 1974. Uh, I think the other thing that many people point out about the 70s is it's not just that they accepted higher inflation, but that the real economy was uh, also volatile with uh, multiple recessions, so 74, 75, the uh, 1980, and then the, the big 1981, 82 recession. Um, and you know the thinking there, or at least casually in my mind, has been that when you have high inflation and variable inflation, the price signals in the economy are not as precise as they would otherwise be. And this distorts investment decisions and consumption decisions across the economy uh, 
people aren't quite sure, uh, you know, what the relative prices really are, and so they make mistakes, and uh, and you get uh, more problems in the economy than you would otherwise have. So the lesson was high inflation, variable inflation, but also a very highly variable real economy as well after 1974. Let's go to the next slide. Can you tell us also what was the inflation forecast in 74? Was, were they expecting it was very transitory and inflation would come back down again or were there? Yeah, if you read the, if you read the transcripts of those meetings, uh, they would uh, blame special factors for inflation. They would say inflation was coming down. If you look at the picture, it, it never went below 5.4% uh, for the next decade, but the, uh, there, was, there was constant hope uh, just around the corner, inflation was naturally going to subside, and they kept the policy rate relatively low compared to the inflation rate. The 1983 committee, which also looked at, sat down and looked at a 5.4% inflation rate, uh, uh, had a different approach to monetary policy. They spoke a lot more about monetary factors affecting inflation and that it was the central bank's responsibility to control inflation. And they de-emphasized special factors. Uh, they kept the policy rate uh, relatively high um, even when inflation was declining. And the associated ex post real interest rate was relatively high. Um, in fact, it was so high, I think that today's economists would say that they, they had such a high real interest rate that they would have caused a recession. That didn't happen after 1983. The, sub, the subsequent experience was that core PC inflation was below 5.4% for the next decade, uh, or in fact, the next 40 years. Uh, the real economy also stabilized. I think that's a key factor um, on why you wanna keep inflation low and stable is that, um, the 80s expansion was quite long. Uh, there was a recession in 1990, 91, and then the 90s expansion was long, very long again. So by stabilizing uh, the inflation rate, uh, we got better real economy outcomes as well. So I would say it's this experience, the contrast between 1974 and 1983, that convinced many that you don't want to get behind the curve on inflation. Uh, so behind the curve somehow means that the 74 committee um, didn't do enough to uh, contain inflation. It was, it was too ready to blame special factors, whereas the 1983 committee got ahead of inflation. They had a high policy rate relative to the inflation rate, high real rates, and that produced uh, very good outcomes in the 1980s and 1990s. And the forecast was in 83 as well that the inflation would come down? You know, one thing about the picture, if you look at it, was that the Volcker disinflation uh, uh, wasn't immediately successful. It actually took all the way through the 1980s and into the 1990s to get to 2% inflation. I, I think that the, it was the 1994 uh, tightening cycle that really established an implicit 2% inflation target for the United States. So um, Volcker didn't really have credibility on inflation. He had to earn credibility on inflation and it took uh, a good 15 years probably to um, establish that credibility. But since 95, uh, we and other central banks have had much more credibility on inflation. That's what's enabled for guidance to be an important part of the story. And that's the, that's the story I'm gonna tell in the rest of these slides. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the first before you go, is so, but we're seeing essentially yeah, that in '73 we had very low real interest rate, and it didn't help to boost the economy. In, in '84 we had a high real interest rate, and it actually led to high growth. Would you make a causal statement to that? In the sense that uh, normally every model would say, you know, if you have a lower real interest rate, it would boost growth while a high real interest rate would actually hurt growth. What's your explanation for this? Uh, well, is, is I think, this that's, I think that's an excellent question. I think if we just, if you just plugged in the 1983 values into your model, you'd probably predict yes. recession uh, because the real interest rate was you know, very high at that point. Uh, ex post real interest rate was very high, but also based on expected inflation was probably also very high. So, um, 
I, I don't think that that is very consistent with what goes on in models. So um, uh, I think um, I want to think in this talk, I want to think more about the credibility of the central bank. It's really that that uh, is the key factor in interpreting the 70s and 80s versus where we are today, um, as opposed to uh, let's say new Keynesian models, which assume the credibility and then, uh, and then try to fit the, uh, the dynamics of the model, assuming that you have a, a perfectly credible 2% uh, inflation target and you're trying to stabilize the economy around that uh, credible target. Okay, let's try the first interpretation here. Um, so first of all, we have to say, uh, we've talked about it already a little bit, but we have to say what we mean by uh, inflation. We do have a statutory mandate to provide stable prices for the US economy. The committee has associated with this mandate an inflation target of 2%. That target is stated in terms of the headline PCE inflation rate. That number was 6.4% in February measured from one year earlier. So we're missing on this dimension of our mandate by uh, 440 uh, basis points. Um, so it's a big miss and there's a lot of inflation. Now, you might say, uh, I've actually argued elsewhere that we shouldn't do this, but uh, you might say that, well, food and energy components are highly volatile, so maybe we should just look at the core PC inflation rate. We've already seen that that was 5.4% as of February. And then others might argue that the current situation is, uh, is really special. We're coming out of the pandemic. Uh, there's been a global inflation surprise. Um, we've got other factors going on, including the war in Ukraine. So uh, the truly persistent factors would be better captured by the Dallas Fed trim mean inflation rate, and that is 3.6% in February measured from one year earlier. So I have a picture that shows these. The next slide. Uh, here's the picture. Uh, the 2% inflation target is the dotted line here. Uh, all three of these, you know, were relatively close to 2% uh, pre-pandemic. The recession is the gray shaded area here. And uh, you can see that starting in 2021, uh, these numbers went up uh, dramatically. Uh, the headline is the blue line there, the core is the gold line and the Dallas Fed trend mean is the black line here. So um, all three of them way up. Uh, the other thing about this chart is to notice if you don't, some of you don't follow uh, uh, you know, current macroeconomics day by day the way I do, but the, uh, that gold line there you know, went up and it did look like it was rolling over a little bit and then uh, went, took a step higher in the last six months or so. So it's really that component right there, uh, November, December, January, you know, February, um, October, I guess too. Um, all of those were high, much higher readings than were previously anticipated. And that gave an extra leg up to, the, uh, to all of these. Um, but, but to have this showing up in the Dallas Fed trim mean is also very worrying because the Dallas that trimming throws out uh, um, the, the biggest uh, price changes to the positive side and the smallest price changes to the negative side. It throws out a very large amount of the data and just tries to get the center of the distribution. But the center, even the center of the distribution, three point, up 3.6% uh, from one year ago. Can now, what I'm going to do here, yeah, go ahead, Marcus. So you made a very important point that you say, oh, the, the new Keynesian models assume credibility, so the inflation anchor will hold. Is there certain measures to look at what's, you know, how the inflation expectations move and whether they're moving more with, you know, gas prices as with salient prices? Would, what measures would you look at to figure out how strict or strongly the inflation anchor is still holding and the inflation expectations are moving up? Yeah. Uh... I'm going to come back at the end to uh, inflation expectations, uh, and I do think it's worrisome. I, I wouldn't say that inflation expectations have become unmoored, but they're threatening to become unmoored. Mm -hmm. 
And I would look at a variety of charts about uh, different surveys that are being taken about inflation over the next one year to three years, um, and also uh, tips-based measures of inflation expectations. But they're all up, and they're threatening to go still higher uh, if the central bank doesn't act in an uh, expeditious way and to keep inflation under control. So that's why I think the situation that we're in is more like the 70s and 80s, where we want to reestablish our credibility on inflation fighting. And it has more to do with that than it has to do with econometrics of uh, local analysis around a credible uh, inflation target. So that leads me. So Jack Schimberlin is asking a question whether the Fed should do some unexpected sharp hike, like 100 basis points, just to signal to everybody it's very, very serious uh, to you know, strengthen the inflation anchor. I'm not asking you to comment on uh, on 100 basis points, but uh, would you say you know it might make sense to send a very strong signal uh, in order to strengthen inflation anchor, or be just too early in order to, for this to be? Strengthened? Well, I, I uh, part of my talk here is to argue that we kind of are doing that. I think in our own way, maybe, uh, but I think we're doing that. Only six to eight weeks ago. Um, you know, markets would have been thinking very differently about upcoming uh, FOMC meetings than they are now. Uh, it now looks like uh, markets are pricing in balance sheet runoff starting in the second quarter here. Uh, they're pricing in uh, 50 basis points at the next meeting. Uh, so uh, those are very different uh, numbers than what they would have been thinking uh, eight weeks ago or six weeks ago. So, um, so I think there has been a sharp upward movement, but the part of the talk here is to say that uh, this has occurred despite the actual moves that we've made only being the 25 basis point move at the at the March meeting. So if you just take a naive approach, it looks like we're way behind the curve, uh, but I'm gonna argue that we're not quite as far behind as you think we are. Okay, next slide. So uh, what, what could behind the curve even mean? Um, uh, what I'm gonna say is that we're gonna use a generous interpretation or the lowest interpretation of the persistent component of current inflation. So I'll take the 3.6% Dallas Fed trim mean value. And then what this will do is help give us a minimal definition of behind the curve. So the idea is to measure the degree to which the current level of the policy rate is less than some minimally reasonable level. So the idea would be that there'd be some, in ordinary monetary policy debates, there would be some range of values and we'd be interpreting whether, you know, the current tea leaves and the current data as to how we wanna interpret things. And then we would, we would have a reasonable argument based on uh, our own individual preferences for our tailor type policy rules, whether, whether the policy rate was um, too low or too high for that situation. But the current situation is different. So the current situation is that the current level, the policy rate is below even uh, the minimal definition uh, that would come out of the, uh, uh, a Taylor rule calculation. So that's going to be my definition of behind the curve. And I think when we do this, we should keep in mind that we're excluding uh, a lot of the inflation that is actually incurring and that the um, Fed's inflation target is ultimately stated in terms of headline inflation. I'm very sensitive to the fact that, uh, you know, typical households, all households, you know, have to face all the prices that are out there in the economy. So they don't get to just pick and choose uh, core inflation prices. A lot of the experience comes from food and energy. So um, I'm sensitive to that. But for this calculation, we're gonna do this minimal definition of inflation. So I'm gonna take Dallas Fed trim mean. Next slide. Uh, Taylor rules are of course famous um, and they've been used in uh, policy discussion for the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, we're gonna do this Taylor type rule with generous assumptions. And then we'll compare the uh, minimal recommended rate to the actual policy rate. And that will give us a measure of the degree to which monetary policy is behind the curve, so to speak. 
Next slide. So uh, I'm asking you to remember your Taylor rules uh, from memory here. Uh, so, uh, but if you want to put in some numbers for a Taylor rule, you're going to need some kind of value for the real interest rate. And uh, so I'm going to use a very generous value of minus 50 basis points. And the rationale for that is that that's what it looks like we were at pre-pandemic sort of the December, January, February period of 2019, 2020, uh, that period right in there, it was about minus 50 basis points because uh, the policy rate was about uh, 150 and the uh, inflation target is 200. So that gives you minus 50 on an ex post basis. So this is very generous. Most people have uh, R star at higher values, uh, like a plus 50 basis points or, or higher. And then uh, you need a parameter value that describes the reaction of the policymaker to deviations of inflation from target. This number is traditionally thought to be uh, bigger than one. Uh, the so-called Taylor principle. So I'm going to use a 1.25 here. That's a very generous uh, low value. And then uh, you have to also say something about the output gap term in the Taylor rule, but uh, I'm just going to zero out the output gap uh, term and I'm going to appeal to our uh, most recent statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, which says that we're not going to worry about labor markets if they're doing very well, and they're doing very well here. Um, so I'm going to zero that part out. So that, so um, this is all, these are all very generous assumptions. They're, they're leading to a lower value of the recommended policy rate than what otherwise you would get otherwise. Next slide. So uh, you put these values in, and this is a non-inertial Taylor type policy rule. The inertia component is just talking about how fast uh, you want to get to this value. But the, uh, the value is that comes out is three and a half percent. So this is kind of the, just the minimal value that you can rationalize through this type of calculation under my very generous assumptions. And the current value of the policy rate is uh, just uh, 37 basis points. So we're a, a good 300 basis points uh, below where we need to be according to this calculation. So this provides a definition of the idea that you're behind the curve. You're below even what the lowest recommendation could be uh, coming out of uh, Taylor rule type uh, calculation. And then we're keeping in mind that uh, you would get even farther behind the curve if, you're, if you weren't as generous with these assumptions about what kind of inflation you want to put in or the parameter values that you want to put into your Taylor rule. So Marcus, do you find this uh, convincing as a definition of uh, behind the curve? I mean, it's, as you said, it's a very generous uh, way of looking at it. And even despite it's so generous, it would increase, it would ask for a sharp increase of the policy rate. But I yeah. guess it will tell us we should look at the long rate rather than only the short rate. Well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this would say, so this kind of says, sets a target and uh, certainly the committee has been, other members have been talking about, you know, moving expeditiously and trying to get to neutral and things like that. And this kind of gives us a, a target about where we need to get to uh, near term. Let's go to the next slide. So can I just... Um, yeah. Ask, so in terms of hikes versus cuts of interest rates, it's not uncommon that you do a you know, 100 basis points cut if there's some financial crisis or there's some huge shock, but it seems not very appropriate to do 100 basis points hike. Is this, is this interpretation correct that there's a, some asymmetry in terms of the reaction function? Because if you look at the Taylor principle, it would be very symmetric if you follow the Taylor rule literally. Or would you say in the real world, policymakers would react differently, whether it's a cut or a hike? I think we need to be sensitive to possible disruption in markets. And if it was literally a surprise uh, increase of that magnitude, um, you know, that probably would cause a lot of disruption and chaos in financial markets. There have been times when uh, interest rate moves were of that, short-term interest rate moves were of that magnitude. 
in higher inflation environments, especially in the early 1980s. And you do have the 1994 tightening episode where uh, the Greenspan Fed increased the policy rate 300 basis points in a single year. And there was a 75 uh, basis point increase in that sequence. Uh, and so it can be done and it, you know, the world doesn't come to an end, but I think we've, uh, you know, in the era of transparency, uh, I think you want to be, you might as well be, since you have more credibility and you can be more transparent, uh, you might as well um, avoid the disruption that might come from uh, really big surprise uh, moves. Um, so I think that's where we are right now. Um, all hope is not lost is the rest of the talk. Uh, so it sounds like we're way behind the curve uh, and uh, but we're not as far behind as you think. So let's go to the next slide. So the point is that since 1995, uh, central banks have, the Fed in particular, has more credibility than it did in the 1970s. And much of that comes from the explicit commitment to inflation target. We have a 2% inflation target. We're trying to hit 2% and we're going to take actions to get to 2%. And that allows us to also use uh, forward guidance as a tool. And so what's happening is that, uh, as the Bernanke quote at the beginning suggests, the, uh, the indications of future policy rate increases are incorporated into current financial market pricing, even before the policy actions are taken. So this has been a key factor uh, in, in since November and the two-year treasury yield and 30-year mortgage rate have increased substantially. So let's go to the next slide. So let me just spend a moment on this slide. The gold line is the two-year uh, treasury yield often considered uh, the best near-term indicator of the path of uh, monetary policy and the 30-year fixed uh, conforming mortgage index rate uh, now trading above uh, five and a, around five and a quarter. Um, now this chart uh, goes back to January, 2020, pre-pandemic. So uh, in the vertical line there is the Haka shift uh, by uh, Chair Powell when he said that we had to retire the word transitory and the Fed was going to get more hawkish. So since then, uh, there has been a lot of discussion, uh, both by policymakers inside and outside the committee. And uh, as a result of that, you know, you've got a good 200 basis points on the two-year and uh, maybe something similar on the 30-year. So this is all in a context uh, where we didn't actually move the policy rate except for the 25 basis points at the March meeting. Now. I just want to point out one other thing about this picture that might give you some hope here. Uh, the pre-pandemic levels of these variables were uh, one and a half on the two-year and a little under 4% on the 30-year fixed mortgage. So the current values are actually higher than the pre-pandemic values by 100 basis points uh, or so. So that if you think that the pre-pandemic levels were you know, balanced growth path, type levels that were consistent with 2% inflation, and then the current values are actually higher than the pre-pandemic values. So you might argue that we're already putting downward pressure on inflation with the current market pricing, even though we haven't actually moved the policy rate all that much. So that gives you some hope that, um, that we are acting appropriately to keep inflation under control. Jim, this, yep. is, this is a nominal, and the inflation is also way higher than pre-pandemic. If you were to look at the real interest rate, it's still highly accommodative. Oh yeah, uh, no, that's true. Uh, but that you know, where are we compared to the pre-pandemic balanced growth path? Uh, this picture would say that we've got rates higher than that. Uh, so, uh, in a Taylor type calculation, that would that would be hawkish. You're leaning against uh, the inflation that that is out there. Plus, you probably think some of the inflation is. Uh, is uh, going to naturally moderate. I've got more to say about this. So let's go to the next slide here. Can I just ask another yeah. question which came up uh, in the chat box uh, about the balance sheet uh, 
activities of the Fed as well. So if you look at these rates, in particular the long-term rates, to what extent is it, do you think, forward guidance? And to what extent is it the fact that uh, you stop the QE measures, the purchases of mortgage bonds? Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And so we're supplementing our uh, hawkish rhetoric on the policy rate with uh, an end to asset purchases and, and uh, hopefully in a coming meeting, the uh, uh, passive runoff of the balance sheet. So, you know, there are a wide variety of estimates of how much impact that has on longer term yields, but I do think it's uh, putting upward pressure on longer term yields. And some of that pricing has already come into the markets as well, uh, ahead of us actually making the decision. So that's helping us as well to go in the right direction to get inflation under control. And it's However, the, I don't have very much on the balance sheet in these slides here. Okay. Um, so the Taylor type uh, rule calculation under generous assumptions recommended a policy rate of three and a half percent. The two year treasury yield might provide a better indicator than the, uh, than the current value of the policy rate about whether, uh, or sorry, where Fed policy is likely to be in the near future. Uh, as of April 18th, the two -year Treasury is 246. I think it's about 260 uh, or 262 this morning. So uh, we're only about, uh, you know, if it's 260, we're only 90 basis points away from the recommended value in the simple Taylor rule calculation. So we're not, under this definition, we're still behind the curve by that amount, but not as much as, it, as you would get out of just looking at the policy rate itself. Now, another feature of this, and my staff is always reminding me of this, is that uh, this doesn't absolve the Fed from raising the policy rate. Uh, this is just saying that the effects of raising the policy rate are present in financial markets right now, um, uh, but we still have to follow through and actually raise the policy rate and uh, in order to ratify the expectations that are out there and embedded in the two-year treasury yield and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Next slide. So, uh, so we're not as far behind the curve, but we're still behind the curve. Uh, so that three and a half percent baseline uh, was made on very generous assumptions about a Taylor type policy rule calculation. If you thought that the value for R star should be higher, then that would lead to a higher recommended policy rate. If you took a broader definition of inflation, such as core PC inflation or headline PC inflation, then you'd get a, a much higher value uh, for the minimum uh, uh, policy rate uh, definition. So this still, even with this second definition, uh, we're still behind the curve, but less than it appears in the first interpretation. So you put a lot of emphasis on communication for what guidance. If I contrast this with other commentators like uh, your former colleague, Bill Dudley, uh, he essentially argues that forward guidance is dead. That's a sharp contrast. How would you reconcile with this? Do you think he has a different perspective on forward guidance? It's a more, you know, Odyssean rather than a communication forward guidance, or like a Delphian forward guidance, or how would Well, if he thinks difference? forward guidance is dead, then I'd ha I would challenge, uh, how is he interpreting the two-year yields? The two-year yield has relentlessly gone up since November because the Fed got more hawkish. Um, that sounds like forward guidance to me. We didn't actually raise the policy rate during that period, except for uh, 25 basis points in March. I mean, it could be that he interprets it as a forward guidance with commitment, such that even if you want to change it later on, you will be reluctant. You can't change it later on. And your interpretation is much more communication signaling what you will do subsequently. Yeah, um, interpretation. Yeah, I, I don't think it's really completely feasible to be Odyssean in that sense that you can say that I won't react to future uh, circumstances. Um, you can you can say what you're trying to do and that you're trying to keep inflation under control, um, but you're going to have to react to uh, data as it comes in. I think we. We found that with the lower for longer in the earlier era, in the Bernanke-Yellen era um, as well, that you could say some things about 
uh, future forward guidance uh, that, that the committee wanted to stay uh, near a zero policy rate for a long time, but you had to make that at least partly conditional on uh, economic uh, uh, events as they occurred. Coming back to the balance sheet, so one way to communicate is just giving speeches, another way is to really doing some balance sheet operations. Uh, it could be that the increase in rates you see is because mostly of balance sheet operations as well. Uh, and that's, I guess I can interpret Bill Dudley this way that, oh, if you really want to credibly communicate, you have to do some balance sheet operation on top of it in order to uh, make it credible. Would you argue, you know, actually it's traditional communication without balance sheet operation is a very powerful tool. Uh, and that's what the recent increase relied on primarily rather than uh, undoing the QE or stopping the QE and perhaps doing QT subsequently. Yeah, I, I guess the way I would think of it is that um, if you have a lot of credibility, you will get 90% of the pricing uh, ahead of time, ahead of actually taking any action. That's because when you say you're going to do something, uh, markets believe you and they price it in right there. But you get an additional uh, reaction on the day that you actually take the move because that's the follow through. And there are always some parts of the market that didn't think you were actually going to follow through and then they have to uh, reprice at the moment that you do follow through. So I think there is not everything gets priced in uh, immediately because credibility isn't perfect, uh, but even if it's very good. Uh, the 70s, I think, was the opposite. So uh, the committee would say they were going to do something. They would say they were going to try to keep inflation under control, uh, but markets didn't believe them so that you wouldn't get any pricing. You'd only get 10% pricing uh, on the announcement or 5% of the pricing on the announcement. And then uh, markets would just wait and see if, if the committee actually did anything. And then the, all the pricing would come on the day that they actually took the decision. So if you're super credible, uh, all, the, everything come, all the pricing comes ahead of time. And if you're not very credible, all the pricing comes on the action itself. Does that make sense? And if you deviate subsequently from the path, but it's because of a big event like the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, you would not hurt your credibility as much compared to the right. So I you. think if you don't follow through and and now you if you don't follow through, then you have to give a reason why aren't you following through on what you said you would do before. And if you give a good reason, uh, then you maintain credibility. But if you give a poor reason uh, or a, a flimsy reason, as they probably did in the seventies. Uh, then markets say, aha, uh, I see that you're just trying to jawbone the market and you're not actually going to uh, follow through. So I now your credibility falls and uh, you have less credibility than you did before. This reminds me like when Mervyn King was on the webinar, he said, you know, it's very important that you have a, a good story behind it as well. Do you agree with that uh, whenever you make some moves? So it's not just only technical interest rate moves, but also having it a good narrative and a good story behind for the reasons. I would agree completely with Mervyn on that. I think that is, uh, uh, that helps you enormously. And then, uh, and that's part of the transparency era is that there's a lot more talking like this <laughs> seminar right here, but the, uh, uh, a lot more talking about, um, well, here's what we think we need to do. Here's why, uh, here's why this will be a good policy. Uh, and then, uh, through that process, you get uh, good market pricing and a good understanding of, of what's happening. Otherwise, you have kind of chaos where uh, the two sides aren't connected. So can I, so other people often look at financial market condition, conditions and, and think of some certain indices, which includes a you know, certain risk premia and other asset prices as well. So here you focused very much on, on the interest rate. To what extent would you put other financial market indices or indicators into the picture as well? And to what extent have they tightened? And you would say that's not primarily how the Fed tries to communicate. It's better to look at certain interest rates. But would you say you take other more broader financial market indicators into account as well? Yeah, the financial market conditions, uh, a lot of those have equity prices as a key component. And I don't like to put equity prices in the same 
basket, um, a couple of things about equities. One is that the U.S. corporate sector makes a lot of its profits overseas. So uh, when they're reporting earnings, they're uh, reporting uh, not just what's going on in the U.S. economy, but a, or over half of it is what's going on in the global economy. Um, and so that's a little bit of a disconnect from where we want to be. And also, I think uh, equities are uh, skewed towards Silicon Valley, uh, the top, you know, I don't know, there are different statistics on this, but the top few firms are a big uh, part of uh, key uh, equity indices. And so, um, you know, do you really want to tie your policy to, uh, uh, you know, valuations of future technologies coming from uh, uh, new firms in Silicon Valley. I'm not sure we really want to do that. So, um, so I don't like the equity component of those indices. They're very sensitive uh, to that. Um, we have our own financial stress index uh, here at the St. Louis Fed, but that's designed to indicate when there's uh, financial stress, uh, and then it talks about volatility and spreads and other factors. Uh, but I wouldn't try to target the financial stress index other than to use it as an indicator about whether uh, we're getting into a situation where there could be um, uh, dramatic repricing in markets because of financial stress. And you would argue corporate bond issuance and uh, lending activities, that's also very much silicon. I mean, the big companies focused on less than SMEs. And then I want to add another one. If you compare the financial market conditions now compared to pre-COVID, would you say they're comparable? Like the, the mortgage rates, or the mortgage rates are even tighter than before in nominal terms? Uh, what's the question? Are we saying, uh, sorry. So the one question was, uh, when you look at financial market conditions, you emphasize very much the equity component, uh, but what's about uh, corporate bond issuances? As, as you know, is the Titan too that, firms have a harder time to issue corporate bonds this time, or at least have to pay a high interest rate. Is this something we should take into account as well? And if you compare the financial market conditions now with the pre-COVID financial market conditions more broadly, were you compared the mortgage rates now with the pre-COVID mortgage rates? Would this translate also to the financial conditions more broadly as well as that now it's tighter than well, I, what I was trying to say is I don't want to look at a financial conditions index to uh, to assess uh, the stance of monetary policy, um, because what that's going to say is basically that you want market, uh, you want equities to decline. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's uh, really the right metric for the reasons uh, that I've given. Also, uh, those equities. Equity prices are, of course, nominal, um, so you really have to look at a, a deflated uh, equity price index. Um, on the bond issuance, uh, corporate bond issuance, I mean, a corporation can fund itself through uh, retained earnings. It can fund itself through uh, equity issuance or bond issuance. Um, on the margin, they should be indifferent between those. So I'm not sure you can read a lot. I, I certainly pay attention to it, but I'm not sure you can read a lot out of uh, corporate bond issues itself. Um, I'm gonna talk about just a little bit about inflation expectations, mm -hmm. and then we can go to general questions. So let's go to the next slide here. Uh, so, uh, you know, my story is all about keeping inflation expectations under control. If we keep inflation expectations under control, then actual inflation will follow. Um, one easy way to understand why that's true is that uh, the uh, corporations and CEOs today are talking a lot about being able to pr pass on price increases to their customers. But um, uh, if you have a lower inflation environment, they won't be able to pass on those, uh, those price increases to their customers and then there won't be inflation in the economy. So that's very much the dynamic that we want to get to. Um, uh, if you look at the five-year inflation compensation measure from the TIPS market, it's uh, 3.36 as of April 19th. Um, expected inflation and actual inflation should be closely related. If you think of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, it says uh, inflation equals beta times expected inflation. Uh, 
beta is a number close to one. So, so basically uh, actual inflation and expected inflation should move one for one according to the theory. You've got another term in there, but it has a small uh, coefficient on it. So um, basically in expected and actual inflation should be closely related. They're diverging right now, and this is gonna have to be resolved. So I've got this picture here. Oh, the next slide which is this picture. So uh, I love this picture. I'd like to get your take on it, Marcus. So this goes back to 2003. This is the uh, core PC inflation rate, the gold line uh, measured from one year earlier and the five-year break-even inflation rate, the blue line. Um, strictly speaking, you wouldn't think that these had to be uh, closely related, but uh, the new Keynesian analysis says that they should be closely related. Uh, the break-even inflation rate in particular is um, uh, CPI-based uh, and has food and energy in it. Um, so, uh, but these are, you know, correlations about 0.64. So I would say this is a huge victory for the new Keynesian Phillips curve. Um, but if you look at the far right-hand side of this after the pandemic recession here, you see that they're diverging. Core and PC inflation is, is 5.4% uh, in the latest reading, and five-year break-even inflation rate is moving up. So uh, this picture tells me that either inflation, expected inflation is going to have to go a lot higher or core PC inflation is going to have to come down, and somehow this is going to have to be resolved. And if if it gets resolved by the expected inflation going higher, that's going to be very hard to fix uh, in the future. And that's why the Fed should move quickly now to get the expected inflation lower, and then the core PC inflation rate will follow behind and um, come back down to 2%. So I think that this is the, the part of the game that's the most important right here is this circled area over to the right-hand part of this chart. You can look at survey measures of inflation expectations and other types of measures. They're all they were certainly near term uh, over the next five years or three years. They're all showing you know, much higher numbers than we've seen in the past. And so basically the same story is being told that inflation expectations aren't exactly unmoored at this point, but they're threatening to become unmoored. Uh, as you can see, that blue line is at the very highest value that it is anywhere else in this chart. So this is a threatening moment for inflation expectations. That's the thing that we have to get under control. We'll move it back down to 2%. Do you think inflation expectations are a continuous process or is it like something at some point it snaps and then it's broken? And uh, it's I, think it's, I think it's continuous uh, and the credibility of the Fed is continuously evolving as well. Um, so. Uh, and it does depend on the, on the actual data that's coming in. So that's all determined in general equilibrium, but, um, but this is what you wanna watch here, I think, is that uh, you know, they're, they're really saying, market is saying, according to this anyway, that uh, inflation over the next five years, see headline CPI inflation over the next five years would be three and a third percent, uh, which maybe is, uh, is, is something that's still anchored, uh, but if it starts to go quite a bit higher from here, it would become unanchored and, and you'd have a lot, it might take 10 or 15 years to get that under control. And a lot of the bond prices are driven by the correlation between stocks and bonds. And traditionally it's the case that the correlation was even negative uh, over the last decade since we have the inflation targeting uh, framework. But, if this goes a little bit wacky, then we might see large bond movements purely from this correlation between stocks and bonds changing. And that might affect uh, also the, the five-year break-even inflation rate as well. Um, do you see any problems coming up on, on that front or any things we have to watch out for? Uh, I, I think that's right. The um, bond market right now is not looking like a very uh, safe place to be with rates rising. Um, so traditionally, I think many investors felt like they could park uh, their investment money in, in, uh, in the bond market temporarily while they were sizing up other types of invest investments that they wanted to make. Um, 
with, uh, with rates rising sharply and the Fed having to act aggressively to keep inflation under control, it's, it's um, a difficult environment uh, for that sort of strategy. And you're hearing a lot of talk about that in, in financial markets. So uh, they'll have to use um, other methods, I guess, uh, uh, to um, allocate their investment dollars. And the five-year break-even inflation rate, do you think the activity of the Fed buying tips or not or buying regular treasuries, do you think that will impact the break-even rate? Can depending on the, yeah, the behavior of the Fed? That's or? maybe the Fed shouldn't be buying uh, in the tips market. Um, I think that's uh, meant to be uh, relatively passive, um, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, I would prefer to get just a straight read out of the uh, break-even inflation rates uh, and uh, and not have us uh, be in there, but I don't think we're the um, marginal uh, component of that. Okay. So I think that's a very important point you're making that you know the inflation expectations are losing inflation expectation of the anchor is, is more continuous variable and that gives actually then more room to protect it. Otherwise, if it's a discontinuous variable, if it breaks, it's, you only see it exposed and then it's hard to re-anchor it. Um, yeah, that's why I'm saying it's, it's uh, more about the, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of game theory about, uh, about establishing Fed credibility. You had, um, Kidlin Prescott and Barrow and Gordon and the subsequent literature, and that was all game theoretic uh, literature. Once you have inflation credibility, then you can go to uh, an inflation target, then you go to something like a new Keynesian model, but that's uh, local analysis around a credible uh, steady state. So that, that I would like to get people to think more in terms of the, uh, of the game theory literature where you need to establish credibility. You need to do enough to drive inflation expectations back to 2% and reestablish the Fed credibility. On the other hand, so you look very much at the, at the bond traders' expectations. If you look at household expectations for the Michigan survey and all this, I think the increase is more dramatic there which expectations would you emphasize the most uh, in terms of if it's more consumption, I guess the household's expectations are more important if, or firm's yeah. expectations for wage setting and, and elements like this. So where do you see the emphasis? Uh, one should look at various expectations, of course, but which ones would you emphasize more? Yeah, I've, I've, I consistently want to emphasize the tips market uh, even, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the idiosyncratic pieces of the, of the tips market, but I like that because it's um, sensitive to incoming data. And so for what I do day to day, I'm seeing like, you know, what did the tips market think about this or that? Um, how, how are they assessing the situation? And uh, of course, markets aren't always right. And I understand that too. Um, but the survey-based measures, I think, are harder to uh, take seriously. I think, uh, um, uh, for instance, they tend to align by political party. Uh, they tend to be different for men and women. For instance, um, uh, I'm not completely convinced that everybody that's answering the survey really has a, a uh, a dog in the hunt, uh, so to speak, on, on whether inflation is 3% or 5%. So uh, nevertheless, I would look at them. And if you look at those charts, uh, they are, uh, generally speaking, they're all up. So um, uh, I think there again, you're getting the same message that uh, people are expecting uh, higher inflation over the, at least over the near term. And that could devolve into uh, just permanently higher inflation expectations in the economy. That would be very difficult to get out of the economy. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I think this is the last slide. So yeah. Uh, so uh, this is just a summary slide. Uh, I've given the, uh, the two interpretations. Um, 
of behind the curve. One is, is uh, we're quite a ways behind the curve. Uh, the second though, is that we're not as far behind as it appears because uh, we've been doing a lot of forward guidance. We have a lot of credibility and uh, not all of the inflation is inflation that, uh, that uh, uh, is persistent enough that the Fed will have to act, act against it. And so uh, those factors make it so that we're not as far behind as it appears, but still, we would have to, um, in the last part there at the last bullet says that we still have to increase the policy rate to ratify the forward guidance that's previously been given. And uh, if we don't do that, we uh, our credibility would slip. So you can go to the final slide here. Please. And uh, let, let me just ask you one thing you didn't mention at all, uh, which was second round effects and the wage price spirals and all this. Are you, you don't see this at all and you're worried about that? Is this something we should watch out for or? Yeah, I think, uh, I think wage price spirals are, uh, are not an equilibrium, uh, are, are not a cause of inflation. So I think that's a symptom of inflation. If you have an economy like Turkey, which has 63% inflation, uh, you know, wages and, and household incomes are going to have to go up by 63% per year somehow in order to maintain their standard of living. And if they don't, then the standard of living is going to be declining. So, uh, but that's not causing the inflation in Turkey. The inflation in Turkey is, is due to uh, the monetary policy that they've been uh, wedded to over the last uh, decade or more. Um, so uh, I think the same is true for countries with less significant inflation issues. Uh, you have to look to the central bank and not to the labor market to understand uh, where inflation is coming from and who can do something about the inflation. Because there's some voices out there saying, okay, we should see some wage increases, but as long as they're just compensation for loss of purchasing power from the past inflation, it's fine. As long as they don't translate into a, into a wage increase process and hence also translate an expected wage increase in the future, it might be okay to contain inflation. Uh, but you would say you would focus much more on the, the price setters, on the firms rather than the wage bargaining uh, element. How important is the wage bargaining? Yeah, I think, and I do think what happened in the 1980s uh, when inflation came under control is you had uh, in the corporate sector, you had uh, low cost uh, producers come in and take market share away from others and produce products at, uh, at, at sort of basic products at low cost. And that was very popular uh, in the 1980s. I would say Walmart was a sort of poster child for that. And, um, uh, and then that took away pricing power from other parts of the market uh, and, and the inflation came to an end. Um, I mean, I don't fault workers. Workers are just trying to get the very best uh, outcome that they can for themselves and for their families. So if they can switch jobs and get paid more, uh, all the more power to them, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. But the question is whether uh, the corporate sector thinks that they can pass on uh, uh, price increases to their customers, or do they think they're going to lose market share if they do that, uh, perhaps permanently, and if you get that dynamic going, then, then the inflation comes to an end. So I would emphasize that side of the picture a lot more, more than the household side of the picture. Right. And then coming back to the interest rate, so there are some questions by Sharman and others. Uh, if there's a runoff of the MBS of 50 billion, let's say, and of Treasury is another 50 billion, what's your estimate? How much will this affect the interest rates going forward? Uh, uh, the balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet, if you if I run off on the balance sheet for MBS, mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, let's say 50 billion each. Uh, do you right. think that is only priced in in the interest rate or you, you would see there will be more elasticity? I mean, do you have some elasticity uh, estimates for that? I think it's partially priced in and I think the remainder will come uh, when we actually uh, start to take action because again, we don't have perfect credibility on this, so it didn't all get priced in right away, but uh, it's certainly anticipated by markets. Um, 
I think the estimates of um, exactly how big these effects are are all over the map. Um, we do have a, a, a survey by uh, one of our staff economists here, Chris Neely, has come out in the Journal of Economic Literature, is forthcoming. Uh, and that paper is a, a comprehensive survey of quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, and its effect in uh, financial markets around the world. Um, so, but what you'll find is uh, you really, uh, the, the confidence bounds around these estimates are quite wide. I do think it has some impact, um, and I do think it, uh, all else equal, it's, it's a curve steepener. Um, and so uh, I, maybe some of that has been priced in just recently uh, when it became more apparent that the committee was uh, contemplating acting sooner on uh, balance sheet runoff than, uh, than previously thought. So some question which came earlier <clears throat> was that you viewed essentially the US very much like a closed economy, but of course, moving the interest rates will also affect the exchange rate of the dollar with respect to other economies, in particular if there are disruptions in other parts of the world and there's flight to safety into the dollar as well. Uh, to what extent are exchange rate considerations playing into the, uh, and the decision making as well? And how is it different from 73 and 84? You know, the, the, the dollar was very different uh, in, in, in the mid 80s. The dollar had a huge boom as well. Was this part of the story which you know helped or was it hurting uh, the economy in your view? And is the dollar strength, is this a consideration to take into account as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take it into account, but when I've looked at charts of trade weighted value, the dollar, um, okay, dollar's maybe a little stronger now, but it's not all that different from where it's been over the last you know, five to seven years, uh, according to that chart. So I think when people are talking about this issue, of course, it's very important to traders if they're actually trading in various currencies. Um, but from a macro perspective, it's not clear to me that the dollar is particularly different valuation globally than it was, uh, let's say, five years ago, um, uh, on average, uh, over the over those five year periods, over that five year period. So, and then, you know, if you look at Japan, uh, okay, well, Japan is sticking with their yield curve control policy in the face of uh, the Fed. Uh, being far more aggressive in trying to contain inflation. So traders are, are trading on that. And so you've got a, 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 big, a big change in the uh, yen dollar exchange rate. But uh, so I think for individual countries, you can, you can tell a story. And US, Europe, of course, you've got the war uh, going on, special factors and, and so on. So, I mean, I'm happy to look at it, but I, uh, I'm not really seeing anything right now that makes me think that that's a dominant factor for, for what policy should do right now. And do you see essentially this huge fiscal stimulus causing the inflation and now running off this fiscal stimulus will help to bring inflation down as well? Or do you think that's just one component, uh, but not the major component to, to look at? Yeah, I think we, um, you know, I guess uh, uh, if we had had this seminar last year, uh, and I, I did get asked in, let's say, the first quarter of 2021, would there be high inflation in 2021? And I said, well, all the ingredients are there. If you're a monetarist, the M2 has uh, exploded, uh, and so the money, money growth is there. If you're a, a fiscal policy a fiscalist uh, on inflation, well, there's been a huge amount of fiscal action, including the December 2020 uh, package uh, passed by Congress and then the March uh, 2021 package amounting to $3 trillion or so. So lots of fiscal uh, action. Uh, if you were a Phillips curve person, uh, then we also had a very tight labor market as well that was likely to get tighter. And so if you thought that was the cause of inflation, uh, we were gonna have that in 2021. So all those things converged in 2021. Uh, so no matter which theory that was your favorite theory, uh, uh, it was all pointing to higher inflation. And indeed we ended up getting higher inflation. Now, um, 
the hope would be that the, the fiscal part would uh, uh, fade over time uh, and we're taking away a lot of the monetary accommodation. And so you will be able to get inflation back uh, to target. The risk is all about inflation expectations becoming unmoored. Uh, if that happens, then it'll be much harder to get inflation under control. But, um, but I think we're moving uh, appropriately to, to take care of that. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim. It was uh, fascinating to, to hear your perspective. And uh, all the theories pointing in the same direction, that's probably comforting, in particular if you want to be a policymaker, then it's easy to make decisions. But for an academic, it makes it harder to identify which theory is the right one, I guess. And perhaps we see it now when there's a, uh, in the opposite direction, perhaps there will be some differentiation and perhaps we can discriminate across the theories a little bit. That's right. The, uh, the problem with being a researcher is that the, the world doesn't provide the right data. Yes. <laughs> one has to be clever to look from the right angle to <laughs> get the right answers. Thanks again, and um, we stay in touch. And um, thanks for being with us, and I hope, and also for all the participants. And hope to see you again in two weeks. Next week there will be no webinar, so I see you again in two weeks. Very good, love Thank it. You. All right, take Bye. care. Take Bye -bye. care.